Okay, welcome everybody to the September 6, 2022 meeting of the Village of Rhinebeck Planning Board. The first item on the agenda has been postponed until um, our next planning board meeting, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit at the end of September. Uh, Liz Mazzarella uh, is not ready yet and they will be back at the next meeting to talk about the uh, recommendation for a positive or negative variance. So the first item on tonight's agenda is New Vance Health, who has, I think, four signs that they want to talk about, but there are different addresses. So the first sign is at 65, 6511-6531 Springbrook Avenue. It's new signage for existing building on the hospital campus. So Ryan, do you have? The pictures of the signs for the audience. I do, unless Nicole, do you have a presentation prepared? I have to turn on your microphone. I Hi. just have a, um, I just have a, a write up prepared. I can share my screen, but I'm not really. We just want to see a picture of, of the sign. Sure. Here, let me uh, share my screen, Nicole, and then you can sort of take over. I don't, I don't know if this is the correct order, but it'll, it'll somewhat match. Well, this is the new sign. All right, you're just out of order from mine, so I have to just get on track with the order that you have. Okay. But this so, is a sign for sixty-five. 11, right? Yes. So for this site, where is my, this is the site for 65 The foundation 31. office. Yep, right. this is yeah, for the foundation for six, office. So this site is um, 6531. Nuvance is proposing to replace a single wall sign. The wall sign is an ivory background with a metallic copper frame, black letters that read Nuvance Health, Northern Duchess Hospital Foundation. Um, the proposed sign is 4.5 square feet. So this is existing. <laughs> this is proposed. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments about the first sign? Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the change of signage for 6511-6531 Springbrook Avenue? I'll make the motion to approve the sign. Do we have a second? I'll second. John. John second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those in favor, a roll. We have to do a roll call vote. John Clark. Aye. Michael Gee. Aye. Aaron Davidovich. Aye. Jeff Christensen. Aye. David Miller. Aye. The motion is approved. The first sign is done. The second sign is 107 Montgomery Street. So 107 Montgomery, what do we have for that? So 107 Montgomery, the scope of work for this site consists of removing the existing 5.25 square foot, pa square foot panel that reads Health Annex and replacing it with a panel that reads Nuvance Health. On that same freestanding sign, they want to replace the three smaller panels. The first panel will read Health Annex. The second is going to be left blank. And the third panel will read Driver Rehabilitation. Each panel is 2.3 square feet. All panels on the freestanding sign will be an ivory background, black letters, and a metallic copper um, frame. Anyone have any questions or comments about the second sign? And, and all of these are... Um, within the legal amount of signage available, I presume? Yes, that's all phase replacements. They're okay. just swapping out the panels. I'll make a motion to approve. Jeff? I'll second that. Michael, okay. Roll call vote. Darren Davidovich? Aye. Jeff Christensen? Aye. John Clark? Aye. Michael Gee? Aye. David Miller? Aye. Okay, the second sign is approved. 
The third sign is uh, at 95-97 Montgomery Street. This sign, Nuvons would like to remove all the signs at this location. That includes the freestanding sign. They want to take the graphics off the panel, leaving the panel blank. They also would like to remove all the signs that are in the um, cabinet on the door and remove all paper signs from the door. So basically they're just removing all the signs from this site entirely. Okay, so the thrift <laughs> shop is closed. Is this, that I, is this temporary or is this gonna be long-term? That they have not told me, but I'm more than happy to ask them for this site. Because we do have a prohibition against abandoned signs. Um, so, you know, I think good practice is you don't put up a blank sign and leave it there. And, you know, if it's a temporary thing in which they're going to come back in three or four months and decide what they're going to do there, that's one thing. But if they're just going to leave it blank for a year or two, then they should just take it down. Well, the sign at, the sign at uh, Hobson's, a.k.a. Far the farm stand, has been white and blank, and it's been up for about three or four years. <laughs> I know. And now there's we a- We told them they had to, uh, had, you know, they have an approved site plan. They, you know, they're moving forward on something, presumably. You know, I just would like to know whether this is temporary or long-term before we approve a blank sign that can sit there for three or four years. Okay. Um, what is the, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, but how long can a sign be left blank before it is not in compliance? It doesn't exactly say, I, I'll, I looked it up. Let me see what it says. It just says under prohibited, prohibited signs. Um, Don, do you think 18 deals with that? Yes, that's what I was just looking up. Um, any sign that does comply um, or which is deemed the abandoned sign or which is non-conforming sign for more than 14 months. So it doesn't say abandoned for 14 months, but the, you know, it sort of implies that, you know, there's a limit. Okay. Because Nicole, what this sign is, this is a street sign. They are very rare in the village. There's, uh, um, there's one at Hobson's, there's one uh, on Route 9, I forget, is that the uh, the old De Laura Delano ha building? You know, there's a sign out on the street, and they're very rare, and we try to discourage them, if, but they're there, and we can grandfather them. So okay. um, we, we really have to, so we, I guess it can, it can be there for 14 months. Is that we're assuming you want to table this for the next meeting and get an answer of what they're going to do with this? I can do that. I can definitely get some sort of either remove it within 14 months or replace it with their across the board updated signage that they're doing across new bonds. So I will reach out to them once we are finished with this meeting and get some sort of plan for the next meeting as to what they're doing with this blank freestanding sign. That's the only one you have concerns about, right? Not so much the door. Because um, all they're doing with that sign is removing. Um, yeah, I think the door is fine. Yeah, the door is fine. It's an em it's an empty store. It's just that this sign, you know, is is rare that we have street signs okay. out on the street, and we don't want to leave them out there. But if they want to leave it there because they want a grandfather, because we would never allow this to happen, were it to be a building that didn't have one of these already, we wouldn't allow this to be installed. So um, we want to clarify how long it's going to be out there. If you're going to, I can't believe we leave the building empty for a year. Um, they probably have some plans for it. And but in order to keep it grandfathered, I'd, I'd assume that you, they need to have some sort of signage placed on it within that 14 month window. Yeah. Okay. And I don't think store for rent is a valid sign. <laughs> so, so it's not a temporary a, sign. Okay. Right. Not a temporary sign. Okay. okay? So Perfect. sorry about that one. That's fine. I will reach out to them tonight about that. Okay. So we're going to postpone that sign. The last new van sign is at a different address, 6511 Springbrook Avenue. And that is. So there's two different proposals for this. I don't know why they sent it over to me. I, I think you have both of them. Um, they're both at 6511. The first one is to remove and replace the non illuminated wall panel. Um, the panel will read Nuvance Health Medical Practice. It'll be a white background with blue lettering. 
And also at this location, they are proposing to do a face replacement on the existing freestanding sign, um, measuring 14.66 square feet. So one of the side of the building looks to be the same size. Um, yes. Where's the other sign? The other sign is also at 6511. Um, that is the Thompson House. Okay, so two separate locations i mean with it, with with this one it's an interior sign it faces no street this is this is the last of the old part of the hospital in in the very back of the hospital oh this is the rear door employee door that i don't know if you were asking me i'm sorry no, we th what we're trying to say is this one's fine. I don't think see if we have a problem with this one. No. Where, All right. where is the second sign? You know, I mean. And now the Thompson one that Nicole mentioned is this one. But that's the same thing. Yeah. Just changing the words. Anybody have any problem with either of those signs on this building? No. no. Okay. No. Can, can I have a motion to approve the two signs at 6511 Springbrook Avenue? I'll make that motion. I'll second, second that motion, Jeff. Uh, all those in favor? Darren? Aye. Michael? Aye. John? Aye. Jeff? Aye. And David Miller, I okay that those are proof. So I have one one problem for you to come back with. Okay, wonderful. I can get that answer for you for the next time. Okay. All right. Now we have a series of signs um, for Paul. Right and there's Paul here. Paul is here. How's everybody doing? Good. We're Maybe. fine. I just saw you the other day. Yes. Um, Walking down the street. The first sign is at 6423 Montgomery Street. It's in Montgomery Road, suite number four. That's on the corner. Yep. Right. And uh, House SFW. Right. Do you, um, Ryan, did I send you these PDFs? Should I share my screen? You did, Paul. So I'm. I'm gonna. I have it queued up. I'll. Uh, I'll share it for you. Okay. <clears throat> um, the folks from uh, House SFW uh, previously applied for and received uh, some permits for uh, window and door lettering uh, at a previous date. It did not involve me. There was a. Uh, an artisan who did some gold leaf and painted um, outlines on the interior glass. Um, beautiful job. They did a really wonderful job in doing it, but uh, because it's on the inside of the glass and with the glare, um, it's really not promoting their business as well as they hoped it would. So um, Piper uh, put them in touch with me and uh, we're looking to do uh, dimensional letter set above the awning, which is uh, pretty much standard across this entire fascia. A uh, paper trail has it, and um, there's a couple of other places throughout this facility that have the dimensional letters above their awning. So, um, want to go on to the next page. I mean, the square footage is is mapped out pretty carefully here uh, in terms of the sizing. We have uh, the client has agreed to remove. Uh, one of the window logos and there was um, the logo on the far left was previously permitted and they I believe they've already removed that. I went by the other day it didn't look like it was in in place. And then there was a half of a square foot uh, permitted for the logo on the door which apparently was never installed. It just ended up doing the logo on either side of the entry of the glass on the building face of the faces Montgomery Street. So what the calculation 
we have pretty much maxed out the six and a half square feet allowed for this particular uh, portion of the complex. Um, and that's really- Something on the door or the windows just above the awning? Oh, we've got something there, okay. And this kind of details, this, this awning uh, on the far left, number A, that logo is to be removed. You'll, you may recognize um, these drawings here because I took them from their initial applications, which they were kind enough to send to me. So um, A is being removed. Um, this, is, this is the, um, yeah, so B was never installed. And the, the one logo on the right-hand side uh, is to remain. And then, so the, basically all they'll be left with is one window logo and one set of uh, dimensional letters and logo above the awning. And this is not on the, so there's nothing on the door. Is the gold leaf still in the right window or? Yeah, the gold leaf is still in the right window. They have left that one. The other one has been removed in anticipation for approval of the dimensional letter set. So we can move forward with that. In case anyone cares, um, the client is interested in removing the awning and washing it and getting rid of all the mold and mildew that's currently on it. And uh, that will, since we have to take it down anyway, letters up, that'll be cleaned and reinstalled. Um, so just give the uh, a nice fresh look. And there's no lighting? No lighting. Any members of the board have any questions about this? Uh, with the new signages here, is they are they maxing out what they are allowed, or do they have more? No, that's it. They're allowed zero after this. We okay. We've maxed it out. The reason I, I'm asking that is the first time we came here, there was no indication of what this business was, and if they're lacking in business, it seems to me that maybe in their signage you should be indicating what your business is rather than just putting letters up. But if they're maxed out, they're maxed out unless they want to change it down the road. Mike, uh, I mean, that's a very insightful comment. And that was one of the first conversations I had with them. Um, they've chosen to put House SFW on the fascia. Uh, that's what the client wishes to do at this point. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? All right, do we have a motion to approve the sign for 6423 Montgomery Street, suite number four? So moved. John. I'll Michael second that. Michael seconds, okay. Uh, roll call vote, Darren. Aye. Michael. Aye. Jeff. Aye. John. Aye. And David Miller, aye. The motion passed, the sign is approved. The next sign um, is a uh, Miranda House, Family Signs of Kingston, 6487 Montgomery Street. Okay, so again, this is the same question Michael just asked. The old sign says Miranda House, bed and breakfast. The new right. sign says Miranda House. <laughs> I mean, does it, does that mean, I mean, it could be a drug rehab center. If they don't say what the business is, it's the second time, they're not saying what the business is. Is that okay? It's, is it still a bed and breakfast? There's no change of use? I don't, think it, I don't know that it's a bed and breakfast anymore, to be quite honest with you. I don't, I'm not certain. You'd have oh, to have Okay. If it's a private residence, I mean, uh, John, what, what does the code say about, you know, this is like uh, one of those uh, uh, signs that say this is the former house of Reverend Quitman. Do we, can that sign stay if it's not a business? I don't think as a resident, you're allowed to have a sign without some sort of uh, variance or something on, a, on a, a regular house. If it's a bed and breakfast, yes. But if it's a, uh, they just want to label their house and the, the date also got five years older since the last time the sign went up. But yes, it did. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, if, unless it's a bed and breakfast, it doesn't get assigned unless they want to go for some sort of, um, you know, home office use or some other reason why you would get assigned. I mean, the Pomeroy Foundation handles 
historic markers, like we just changed the one on the Quitman House, home of Reverend Quitman. If this was, you know, George Washington slept here, you can apply for a formal thing from the state. Um, but you can't have a sign that says uh, formerly the veranda house, because that's so, not, formally this was the parsonage for the for the Messiah Church. Oh. So, so, Paul, do you want to go back and talk with Jason and sort of get a better direction on what's going on here? Before yeah, I probably will. I probably will. There was a bit of a misunderstanding. I thought he was handling this. He thought I was handling this. We work a lot with uh, Corcoran Group. And he's uh, got a lot of irons in the fire, as do I. And so um, he had just asked us to like make the sign and we ended up doing it. I don't know. I mean, the historical angle is an interesting one. We should explore that. Um, I mean, I don't know that you guys would even be willing to grant a variance for a residential property with uh, for a sign. I it mean, doesn't exist anywhere in the village. Um, I think I think the Delamater House has a sign, doesn't it? But that's a yeah. commercial business. Yeah, I'm it's trying to think. Business. No, is it not? Yes, the Delamater House is a business. So yeah, that's a business. Yeah. So um, you know, there were no. I mean, if you're, there could be a sign or a shingle um psychologist or, or cpa or something like that there's a business in the building but we don't know what this is and this is a private residence it can't uh, you know in the 30s and 40s it was the parsonage for the messiah church in 1949 they built the current residence and sold this um to someone who went to a chain of people and began bed and breakfast not in 1840, you know, bed and breakfast a couple of decades ago. So it can't have a sign if it's a private residence. We have no precedent for that. Okay. I, I, you, you, could, you could text your or, or call your client. If you can get a hold of them and stick on the meeting and come back later. Otherwise, we'll see you in a couple of weeks with an answer. I mean, Duchess, Duchess Signs, I think they are up in Red Hook, was handling all the um, historic uh, brass plaques that we put on the doors uh, of all the buildings during the big push to get the uh, the date circa whatever 1830, 1850, 1900, and we several hundred of them were installed on the buildings of the historic district that they can get, um, and they have such a sign that they're still in business somewhere on on Market Street in Red Hook has the template that every all the other signs are being used for. That they could nail up if they can prove it, they can nail up circa 1840 on a brass plaque. On I'd the be, door. certainly be interested in some of the history if you have that to share, David. You've been um, kind enough to do that on a couple of other projects. One of them is the uh, uh, Le Petit Bistro, which uh, we have ended up printing that and putting it in the restaurant, which is great. And I'm sure Jason would appreciate that. And maybe that is the way to do this. Um, I'll ask him. I'm sure the sign won't go to waste. I mean, it could probably be installed on the back porch or in the house somewhere, perhaps. Um, but uh, I, I will certainly let him know. I'll ask if he wants to pursue this. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's likely that uh, a variance would even be granted for this other than doing a historical marker. Um, and there's nothing historical about it. It's, it's, it's one of the 500 houses on the National Historic Register in the village of Rhinebeck, it's not that special. I mean, it's history is history. A lot of houses, my house has a lot of history in it. You know, a lot of people lived in it. Sure. Um, so the veranda house is really nothing more than the previous building. It was a bed and breakfast. And before that, I don't know the history. I would, all I know is that I have pictures from 1945 when it was the parsonage in 1949. The parsonage was built at its current location next to the church. And that building was sold. And what yeah. happened in the, in the succeeding 70 years until Veranda House showed up, I don't know. Right. But it's been there way before. And the Messiah Church was built in around 1900. So you've got, you know, another, well, 45 or 50 or 60 years, depending on that number, um, that it was something else. So they would also have to take down the entire structure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay from the previous applicant, no blank signs. Mm -hmm. 
it, no, it, not it's not even a business. Fourteen months for a business, not you know, um, uh, you know the the uh, Hobsons, aka the farm stand, is 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 in violation technically. If fourteen months is the uh, the time limit, we thought it would be occupied by now, but apparently that is a. Uh, up for rent. They're trying to find a farmer to operate the farm stand. So that's why it's empty. That's what I was told. A long time during, you know, post-pandemic construction does take a long time. So I, I, I can understand their, uh, the delay on that. So, right. Um, all right, I'll, I'll talk to the client and we'll, uh, we'll seek, uh, I'll get some information from them and we'll get back to you and let you know whether we're gonna reapply or just remove the sign. Okay. 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 We'll talk about the historical marker. Okay. The next item, again, is timely signs. It's on uh, the uh, Star Building, 6417 Montgomery. There are two signs. They told us previously that the left side would be uh, of the former restaurant would be a real estate office and the right side was going to be a restaurant. And so the first sign, item on the agenda is for um, Rouse and Company Real Estate. Yeah, this is pretty much uh, the same exact size as 100 mile above it. Um, if you, I think you go to the next page, you there. This is, we, we had come to be, before any of these spaces released, um, we came, you know, uh, M West, uh, real estate development came to the had us come to the village to apply for this amount of square footage. So this is not anything really new. They're just kind of leasing the space at this point. We're just showing you how uh, what's going in where. Okay, so 100 miles is existing. It's everybody gets six square feet. It's very equitable. Um, so here you've got 100 mile, which is currently in place with lighting, and then Rouse and Company goes below. Uh, we're just going to need to manufacture some longer bars to uh, drop the sign down below that. It's, it's still above seven feet, though. Of course, yeah, it's it's pretty high up. Okay. Higher than that, probably about nine feet, I think. And it's double sided. Mm -hmm. Any questions about uh, Rouse and Company from the board? Hundred miles. Well, what about these showcase signs on both sides of the door? What about them? They were um, they were permitted, you know, they were allowed to to stay there, um, and uh, what they've done is kind of split them in half. So the hundred mile gets the left top, Rouse and Company gets the uh, left bottom, the restaurant gets the top right, and the and then the lower level. I don't know who this is going to go into that. They've yeah. basically put quadrants on it. So you know, these technically are signs. So unless they can be considered directional signs, they have to be added to the total. You know, if you have restaurant, uh, you know, menu there, that's considered a directional sign. Um, yeah. Hours, um, you know, identifying which floor you're on, or, you know, say first floor left or whatever, that's, I think would be okay as a directional sign. We allow that for restaurants and that sort of thing. Uh, to give hours of operations or menus or, you know, park and rear or whatever, those sorts of directional signs. If they're going to be used as additional identification signs, they have to be under the limit. Okay. So I think we, if we, if we approve this, we just have to put in as a condition that those showcase things on flanking the doors will be used for directional purposes. Well, we can certainly do that. I mean, the original one for 100 Mile had a uh, some text on there that said they were on the second floor. Yeah, yeah, that's directional or a menu. We've always allowed menus to go in those glass cases. Okay, but, but it can't be a specific sign. And again, 100 Mile doesn't say what it is again. But I guess <laughs> I'm I'm you know old and don't know the modern way of doing things. But um, as long as people know what it is and they can find it, and they're fine. So anybody else have any questions about this sign? Paul, just a quick question on the, the Pantone color there. You show the black, you call out what it is. But not knowing those, just is there consistency between the 100 mile sign and the Rouse and Company? Or is that intentionally less black than the 100 mile? 
Um, it is less black. It is a dark gray. Okay. And then we have two other signs coming up later, or at least one that's also in, in, in a black palette. So right. just trying to figure out if that was intentional, that these would all vary somewhat, or there's some consistency trying to be established for the building as a whole. Um, I believe all of the image imagery for at least Rouse and company and um, the, the restaurant was kind of, developed independently of the signage that it currently exists. 100 Miles theme has always been black and white. I think Rouse and Company has uh, more of a dark gray theme. And I don't know what the lower level tenant could be pink. I have no idea. I have no right. idea. I, th I think it's it, the top two signs on both posts will be largely a monochromatic look with black backgrounds. But I don't think um, as these spaces turn over over the years, if somebody moves out, that there can be a reasonable expectation that they'll all be black and white or black or monochromatic. So I think each tenant has to have um, the autonomy to be able to select a color that's right for their brand or business. So, you know, it's, it is intentional. I know that it's close and I'm confident that uh, the finished product will not look like a mistake. Um, I think that's what I was after is are we worried it looks like a mistake or an older sign next to a newer sign I, I think the the screen the screen color may be different it, it's kind of a dark uh warmish gray and when you see the final sign it'll look very intentional Understood. so um they have a motion to approve the sign with the conditions that uh, the four allocated sections of the two uh, glass cases must contain directional signs for the four business. Uh, or menus. Menu, which is a directional sign. Yeah. I'll make that motion. Okay, John Clark yeah. makes the motion. We have a second. Jeff, all second. Jeff's second. Okay. All those in favor, Darren. Aye. Michael D. Aye. Jeff. Aye. John. Aye. David Miller. Aye. The sign for Rouse and Company Real Estate is approved. Now we come to the next item. Which is Excuse me for a second, uh, David. Ryan, Ryan, if you can hear me, I can hear the meeting, but my monitor has decided to freeze. So I may need to drop and re-enter. So please keep your eye on the waiting room in case I need to do that. Thank you. I can hear Of you course, see, Jeff. Oh, you can't see us. Okay. There's probably a bandwidth issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, At least this one says bar and restaurant. It says bar and restaurant. It doesn't say what kind, but... <laughs> It says, David, you're so old fashioned. I mean, you want to have. I know. I want, I, I'm, I'm not used to you. Come, you probably take a picture of a barcode and it comes up with what they have in their stock, whatever. I don't know. I'm old. What do I, what do I say? <laughs> me too. I don't get it, but it is what it is. So, pre to think so really tells me whether this is an Italian, a French, an Indonesian, Thai. So, what's what the thing? I like to eat. Huh? What did Hemingway like to eat? That's right, the Hemingway quote. Yes, that's, that's where it comes from. It's the last line of uh, the sun also rises in the book. So that's where it comes from. That's the source. Ah, he, he loved Spain. Maybe it's a Spanish restaurant. Not the... <laughs> All right, so same exact thing. Yeah. Six square feet, same lights will be hung. Is on the other side, it's going to be a little further down the street. The brackets and the lighting were already pre approved and are currently in place. So we're just really talking about sign panels. This one happens to be a true black with a white letter. Now, we had asked this before. So you've allowed square footage for the lower level, should somebody decide to rent that? Because originally we questioned the amount of signage available. That there'd be no, if these signs were too big, there'd be nothing left for the basement, which used to be, I think, a part of the restaurant. So you've allowed six square feet should someone rent the restaurant, the basement. Yeah, that, that is for a future tenant. 
um, which they expect to rent to someone. Um, there's not a ton of space uh, in the, you know, when you remove the square footage of what is what used to be Liberty, which was both sides of the building interior wise, um, there is a ton more seating outdoors, which obviously is seasonal. And then they also have that side porch area, which is pretty substantial. I think it still needs some work. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know much about the restaurant industry or how they factor the amount of footage they need to, uh, to make their rent each month and a reasonable amount of profit. But um, the, the downstairs space was part of the Liberty, the former Liberty space. It's, it's, a, it's a really huge space. Um, it could be its own club, you know, whatever. I mean, the, ideally the, the landlord did want to rent the entire space. Um, it hasn't turned out that way. So they're kind of carving it up and um, allotting it to uh, sizing, right sizing it for whoever the, the interested tenants are. So Excellent. Ryan, help me on this. We approved the site plan for the, for the renovated building and we allocated tables and chairs to the potential restaurant in the front and on the side of the building. And that was allocated in the parking in the back. Correct. Okay. So now if this square foot is allocated, which is fine, what about, we'll have to deal with parking and, or, you know, for the, for the, uh, what it's, what's going on down there. If it's a restaurant, it could require a lot of parking unless they want to reallocate seating. I don't know. Well, not, as I've said in the past, we 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 don't have all high functioning crystal balls, so we yes. don't we don't know what the future holds for that um, lower space. Um, I think it's going to be a unique uh, proprietor or business owner to choose that space. Uh, being someone who's been down there, um, I can tell you that. There is very little natural light, if any, um, and how the Liberty had it divided and, and used, um, you know, there was only one real sort of private dining area and whatnot. What it exists today, I have no idea. So I, I don't know what. You may have to address when they come back, there is room for a sign for whatever would go down there. We're going to have to address the parking, whether there was enough in that approved. Uh, so house. we'll have to see what the future holds for. No, I'm not asking the ball, Ryan. I, I, I know you don't have one. Sorry, David. Are we talking about the ground floor right side of the building, or the basement? We talk, we're talking about the basement. There was a huge basement down there. Right. They had some private dining or overflow dining down there when it was the Liberty Tavern. Yeah, I think they said uh, a, a while back, I, th I think when we went over the parking and in the rear of the building, that they uh, this was raised and they said if they ever intend to use the basement for any business purpose, they would come back to us at yeah. that point. So, so as I said, yeah, that's what I was saying. When they come back, there's, there's six square feet for a sign for, you know, John Smith blacksmith downstairs or something, but then you have to have parking for whatever, based on what kind of business it is. So um, we'll have to address that issue when they come back. As long as the owner is aware of that, that uh, there could be an issue with parking. Go off on a tangent, but I mean, how do you, how do you allot parking to something like the Bistro? They, I mean, where does anyone park in Rhinebeck is wherever they can find a spot. I don't think that they're, they're, they're you know, like, there's a whole section of parking regulations. There is parking in lieu of fees, which just went through a change and a revision of the code a couple of years ago. You can pay a thousand dollars parking in lieu of fees if you don't have parking. The parking code is a very complex thing. And I believe that it is being addressed in the comprehensive plan committee meetings, what to do about parking in the village. I went to about the strange parking code, but we have to play with the rules that exist today and the rules that exist today vary 
from business, professional office, restaurant, but to see what the business is and look how the, the rules apply to it. Okay. I'm just interested in signs. I know. Yeah, the parking is, it, it, you're right. There, parking is impossible. There is no parking. But it's a problem that the village has. So um, future tenant sign is not up and it's not going to be up until there's a future tenant, right? Correct. Okay. And we're not up there until there's a tenant. Yeah, of course. Okay. We just don't want blank signs. There is no blank signs. <laughs> All right. All oh, right. This Paul's just, just being professional. He's the future tenant is he's not doing there. his due diligence. Thank you, John. Always on the case. No, so it's gonna be a that future tenant sign is not there. It's, it's not. Pretty it's think so. Yeah, okay. I'm not putting a blank sign there. We, for all I know, that you know, it, it may be a long time before the basement is leased. It may happen next week. I just, you know, again, I have, I do not have a crystal ball either. So I understand how hard it is for Ryan. So oh, it'll only be a single sign hanging there then. A single, okay. sign. very much like the way uh, 100 Mile is. Right On today. We put uh, Rouse and underneath it. We have a motion to approve the, the second sign for the restaurant at 6417 Montgomery Street with the same condition that the four allocated spaces and the two glass display cases on either side of the entrance will be used for directional signs only. Make the motion. John. I'll second that. Michael, he seconds it. Roll call vote. Darren. Aye. John. Aye. Michael. Aye. Jeff. Aye. David Miller. Aye. Okay, that second sign is approved. I think we're done with John. With uh, we're well, done with signs. We're done with signs. Eight signs. We succeeded in seven of them, which is pretty good average. Forty-two it's minutes, Chair. That's that's got to be a record. Yes. Thank you for <laughs> great applications. And uh, have a pleasant evening. We'll be in touch. Thank yes, you. Paul. All right. Th the next one is um, 64 Locust Grove. And this is a new one. This is not in the code. We haven't had to deal with this one before. Um, it's for a freestanding solar array under a design of like a lean-to or open garage or whatever you'd want to call it. The only other example we have of freestanding solar arrays is out on, uh, what's the name of that road, Ryan? Uh, Wine Coop Wine Lane, Coop. Chair. On Wine Coop Lane. It is a big solar array and a very large uh, uh, estate that's being worked on. So we haven't seen this before. So we have to try to break some new ground. We have pictures of this. Uh, we do. Um, the representative from Sun Common, I believe his first name is Mitchell. Are you with us, Mitchell? I know you're signed in, but I don't know. Um, the other representative from Sun Common is unfortunately held up in a another Municipal Planning Board meeting. Um, All right. Can you do? You, you have a sample of what uh, we had. A, we had Michael and I had a pre meeting last week with Ryan, and we got the overhead view of the neighborhood and some samples of what this thing would look like. And uh, we have to be careful because we're breaking new ground. So this thing's going to look like a, a, a carport with a slanted roof facing the sun with solar panels on top. And the rest of it was some kind of a, a timber framed carport. Can you move that down a bit and pick some more pictures? So that's the basic structure. <laughs> so Sun Common refers to it on their website as a solar canopy and i believe based on their 
um, advertisement um, that this would be known as a single solar canopy. So uh, my says you could put a car under there. You could put a picnic table and chairs under it and you'd get the shade from the sun and uh, there'd be solar panels on top of it. Yes, the solar panels act as the roof. Is there, there's a picture of it somewhere. I don't know if I have a color picture of a chair. I know there's a uh, color picture on Sun Commons website. Now we looked at some um, overheads of the neighbors and the property and where this thing would be sitting. Do we have that? Hold on, bear with me, Chair. Concern. This property is sort of on a dead end road at the very end of the road. Backing up against, I believe, the woods. There we go. Uh, hold on, Chair. Okay. So the property in question is right here at the end of Locust Grove Road. It is 4.4 4 acres. And I believe the proposed canopy would be located somewhere here in the backyard. So um, it's not very viewable. There appears to be... Uh, woods up in the top up on the top facing the woods development there is a lot of trees to the left trees to the front and uh um you know they're, they're not too close to neighbors um except maybe the one towards the right one five one three six nine six With respect to glare, it seems similar to the roof mounted arrays that are already there today. So I guess a question for Ryan would be, has there been any comment from many of the neighbors prior with respect to any issues coming from the existing solar arrays? Because this seems to be a lesser version of, of those, both in its size and how low it is to the ground com in comparison to what's on the house already. To date, Darren, there has not been... Um a uh and any complaint filed about the existing solar the roof mounted solar that's that's on the house to date and actually the representative from sun common just just joined us so i'm gonna i'm gonna let him take over hey ryan thank you so much and i apologize to the board i <laughs> i just left a, a meeting in the town uh they like to talk tonight so i apologize um, all right, so this is project is for Robert Aaron Bard at 64 Locust Grove. Uh, we are proposing an installation of a ground mounted solar canopy uh, mounted on a timber frame construction in Robert's backyard. Uh, the system is consisting of 24 panels mon mounted on the top of the timber frame uh, and one inverter. The inverter will be mounted on the side of the house next to the utility meter. Um, the AC system size is 7.68 kW. Uh, the project setbacks are, this is a, um, let's see. Do you have a picture of what this looks like? That's what we were trying to see if we could find. Uh, sure, yeah, I can pull it up. I don't, let me, give me one second. I'll try to make an attempt to share my screen here. All right, 
Can you see my screen with the plans here? Yes. yes, you can make them a little bigger. Got it, okay. All right, so this is the timber frame itself. Um, and then, so the panels, 24 panels mounted on top of here. Um, and then I'll go to the site plan. So you can see we're sitting it right here uh, in his backyard. Um, and then the project setback. So we're 182 feet from the front, uh, 157 and 214 from the sides, 306 to the rear. And this is a 4.3 acre parcel. Um, it's pretty well screened. Um, there's, as you can see, uh, a lot of tree lines. Um, you know, I drove by it myself. You're not gonna see it from the road. Um, and especially with this being almost five acres, um, you have quite a bit of property there. Um, he has existing rooftop solar. Um, you can see where they're drawn out here, just an older photo. Um, the old system size is 16.75 kW, uh, 48 panels and two power walls. Uh, those backup batteries. Um, there will be a trench, um, 200 and so it's a total of 220 feet, um, but we're, it's not all going to be underground. Uh, we're gonna trench from the array to this corner of the deck right here. Uh, and then we're going to wrap the deck with conduit, have a very small um, 65 foot trench over here. They'll tie on on the side of the house. And you can see that on the site plan that's here as well. And that's the, the gist of the project. Can we see a picture of what this looks like? There are pictures on your website or on your brochures. Uh, let's see. Already built. Um, I can show you an example of a previous job. Uh, same size, 24 panels. Uh, let's see if we can get a nice pullback of the array. There we go. So that's what it looks like. It's a timber frame, uh, four posts. Um, they go six feet deep. Um, and the array itself sits 13 feet uh, from the ground to the very top of the array here. Yeah, so, um, so <clears throat> for the board, my concern is that we are setting a precedent here. This is certainly an unusual, almost five acre single family house, which is extremely rare in the village. But should someone want to build a carport on the side of his house or in the backyard with solar panels, we'll be setting whatever we decide tonight um, we should express our opinions about it because we'll be setting a precedent, something that's not in the code. So I'd like some opinions from the board about this. It could be considered under the accessory structures in the residential district. You know, it says uh, greenhouses, tool sheds, garden sheds, and other <laughs> similar structures. So I think the closest thing we have in the code is that it's, a, it's considered an accessory structure in a residential district. And accessory structures uh, have to be have certain setback requirements are not permitted forward to the front plane of the principal structure. And the combined footprint of all accessory buildings should not exceed 75% of the principal structure, no more than three accessory buildings. So there are some limitations in the code if we consider this not something that's um, atypical, but just a different sort of. Um, accessory structure to a residential building. I mean, it's it's sort of like an arbor, only with panels on top. So that's what I would propose. And since it's got huge setbacks and uh, not gonna be visible from neighbors and is a pretty nice looking thing anyway, 
Uh, I don't think there's any problem with it. It's not in the front plane uh, in front of the house. Um, so I think it meets the conditions of an accessory building or accessory okay. structure. So if, if we have that part of the code, that's enough if somebody wants to build one of these on a standard uh, lot in the village and put it in their backyard or put a picnic table underneath or something like that. It's almost like a pergola, except for the roof is odd. Yeah. Different. And I think we should be encouraged solar panels wherever we, you know, especially if they're not on the front of a historic building or something right. to that effect. Something in a backyard like this in a non-historic district with plenty of room for screening and that sort of thing. Oh, no, this is not a problem. Precedent. Yeah, this is not a problem at all with the, with this five acre property. Is certainly not M Michael, Darren, Jeff. I, I don't have a problem with this one because it is on an almost five acres. It's totally screened from any kind of neighbors and, you know, it is a green technology, um, but it is perhaps a precedent because we haven't seen too many of these, and we do have a big chunk of the village's historic district. And what if somebody wants to put these things on a house that you know was built in the eighteen early eighteen hundreds? So you know, I, I'm all. I'm almost inclined to think, even though I would approve this the way it is, I almost think maybe we should have a public hearing. I, um, I, I was going to suggest that, Michael, so I'll just jump in. It's Jeff here. Um, and I absolutely agree that we should, my opinion is we should encourage um, renewable energy uh, solutions. Uh, I think solar panels are a great thing. Um, and I think at the end of the day, this will probably not be uh, much of a problem. As John is pointing out, the code section 120-27 residential general provisions point A on accessory structures. Uh, we could do this, although it says they're not exceeding 144 square yeah. feet, although I think this might be. Um, but I think, um, I think we should encourage this type of thing. And I think also we should have a public hearing, as Michael says. One reason for that is um, a couple of years ago, Sun Common had proposed a, uh, it was bigger than this, but it was a small community solar array, CSA, in the town of Rhinebeck. Um, and uh, the neighbors objected and banded together. And this went on for more than two years. Uh, and ultimately uh, they, they gave that up. Um, and they had people coming out saying things like they were afraid their children were going to develop uh, um, autism from the uh, solar panel. There was a lot of ridiculous stuff. You know, people will be able to see it from a plane in the sky. They were that they were objecting to it that much. So I think um, if we have a public hearing, it'll it'll we'll get public comment on that, and that will guide us in future um, uh, scenarios like this where we have. Um, uh, renewable energy solar array that frankly is attractive I don't want to be subjective and probably can't be seen one of the things that they did uh, with that um, proposal in, in the town of Rhinebeck was they did a study and they demonstrated very clearly that there would be absolutely no line of sight visibility from any of the perimeters of the property so uh, I, I say let's let's have a public hearing. But, and, uh, well, I agree, going. but that that you know this again is unique. It's a five acre, acre property will not be seen from anywhere, just like the proposal to the community solar. But then I some people might want to put in a so, someone's coming next to to build a carport, I believe, and um, someone might want to have it on that thing or a pergola in the backyard, and we need to really make sure that because this is specifically stated in the code that we have established a precedent that will hold when this comes forth later in the future, that we, we've established what we've done, what, what the rules would be. And then we can also talk to the a comprehensive plan committee and make sure this change goes, the specifications for this kind of a thing go in the new 
the code revisions they may be working on. I think there needs to be a public hearing on this one. If you know, because of the location, I drove out there. You can't see anything on this property, and from the aerials, it's clear that you're not going to be able to see it anywhere from anywhere around it. I don't see how we're setting any sort of precedent and why we would need a public hearing. If you want to encourage solar, you shouldn't delay things. We have the discretion to have a public hearing or not. I don't think this is going to be a, an any sort of controversial issue. If somebody wants to put it in their backyard or their front yard where it is, invis where it is clearly visible from neighbors, then we could have a public hearing. Just a reminder too for the board that in any other property, the proposal would have to conform to bulk and area regulations. So if the proposed project does not conform to bulk and area regulations, then it would need a variance. Can you explain them, please, Ryan? So uh, bulk and area regulations are your setback standards, but also your lot coverage percentage. So um in any other uh so if you look at uh in chapter 120 uh section eight the dimensional table um that's your percentages so anywhere else in the village um the proposed project would be um subject to um those regulations and if that project cannot meet those regulations on that specific property um then they would need a variance it also be very hard on a smaller standard lot to find a treeless sunny area where some of this could be built and i i would have a hunch that the department of health would have a serious issue with this being built over a uh septic system yeah Darren, how do you feel about it i think the one thing that jeff said that still resonates with me is just that line of sight impact so while i understand we don't necessarily need to do a public hearing on something a parcel that's this large because those issues don't appear to exist i'm worried if we're setting a precedent where it would be harder to require a public hearing in the future on a smaller village lot where something might meet the bulk and dimensional standards that Ryan's talking about, you could easily meet setbacks, but have this right outside the neighbor's window. And, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of ways to mitigate this. And this is done very tastefully. But I could see that being the main issue with the solar, even more so than some of the, you know, the complaints people have had over the years about health risks. I just think the the visual from especially upper story windows could be a problem and a precedent setter in the village. So I'm not necessarily worried about this parcel, but I am worried about potentially what happens to, to neighbors as a result of solar popping up in the village. I, I think that's a good point. And, and, and as, is it Mr. Grayson or Grayson? Uh, Grayson, you can call me Mr. Grayson, whatever okay, you want. That, that's your first or <laughs> last, for the, for the minutes, that's your first or last name? Uh, first name. What's what's your last name for the minutes, sir? It's it's really difficult. It's Ball. B A R. Okay. Well, maybe maybe Ryan can get it. But just to get back to Darren's point, um, I, I I think um, without question, um, if there were if there was just a quick line of sight um, representation, I can't imagine there would be any problem whatsoever. As Mr. Grayson has mentioned, there it's 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 between 182 and 214 feet from lot lines. So I can't fathom that any line of sight would um, be a problem. But if we did just uh, have a uh, line of sight confirmation, then we could, I, I think at Darren's point, that's what you're- That a precedent. We could apply that to anything in the future, which would be especially important to dense residential backyard type issues. Yeah. So I, yeah, I don't. I I kind of agree with John. We don't need to make an example of this one because it's not. It's another unique case that can't that can't be. It's even better than the previous one on Wine Coop because that was visible to some of the neighbors. This one is not. That we. But I think that Ryan, you need Lydia's not here tonight. Can you communicate to Ken or someone that this needs to be 
looked at by the comp plan committee and specific regulations for these kind of freestanding solar. As I said, if you can find a, a place in a regular small lot that has the proper setbacks and isn't covered by trees, I think you're going to be hard pressed to find something like that. But as I, I agree with John, better than on the front of on the front of a historic building. I'd rather have it in the backyard. As a yes, I can, Chair. I can I I can send that comment along to to I our think, to our liaison. I think the majority feels we don't need to take the applicant's time to have a public hearing on this because this is not a non-controversial topic. If someone wants to do this, um uh and, and Grayson should be aware that someone wants to do this in their backyard, especially in the historic district, there will have to be some you know, mechanism for dealing with it until and or the uh, comp plan committee modifies the code to deal with something which is always something new popping up like this. I, I have a question. I haven't been there, but from the pictures we saw tonight, the existing house has a lot of solar panels on is that correct that's correct there are 48 panels on the roof uh, is that generating all the electricity that the house needs uh no so this is this is to help it's not so that right. you've already maxed out you're not generating income from this is my question right of course okay I mean, you generate. I, I think. I think we, we. If I can make a suggestion, um, I'm. I'm also fine. I don't have a problem with. In fact, I also want to encourage renewable energy, and I don't have a problem with approving this. Um, uh, I think we should state as part of our approval. We approve it as it's obvious to the planning board that there are no line of sight concerns for any of the neighbors, and that way, if somebody in the future wants one in a very tiny lot will say well we approved this because it was very obvious there were no line of sight uh and secondly i think maybe michael mentioned co confirming that this is not over a uh, septic system uh, right. confirmed. yeah we we have to add that right we have to add that to the code to define all these things the setbacks septic systems um well, the, the code already says you can't put something over a septic system. Right, you can't. So I'm just I'm just asking Mr. Grayson to confirm it's not over a septic system because we could we could motion to approve this tonight, and I'm just asking that we include in that motion uh, the statement because we we're we've looked at the plan and we're we're um, we're convinced that there 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 could be no line of sight issues for any of the neighbors because of the unique size of this lot. Yes, yes. So we have to come up with some exact wording so we have it that we're sort of writing code tonight, you know, uh, setting precedent that that uh, we, we approve this thing because it's a unique large property in the village that, that there is no line of sight that any neighbor could see this mm -hmm. is not over and it's not over the septic system. Mm -hmm. Yes. All of that. All right, I guess I just made the motion to approve the, uh, <laughs> Sun Common Project at 64 Locust Grove Road. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, a roll call vote. Jeff Christensen. Aye. Darren. Uh, just confirming that the conditions you mentioned are part of that resolution? Yes. Yeah, aye. Michael Gee. Aye. John Clark. Aye. David Miller. Aye. All right, we approve this with specific sort of comments so that we are, are establishing some precedent, which hopefully will be formalized in the next year or so um, by the uh, comp plan committee. Okay, good luck. It's really good, very attractive structure. Thank you. And as John said, better than on the front of a historic building. Right, so of course. Thank you for your time. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is 57 Chestnut Street, proposed insulation of, a, of an in-ground pool in the backyard behind the existing garage. 
and it's because it's in the historic district and the residential district as well. Hello. All right, I'm Stephen. I'm with Dean Jane Pools. I'm representing uh, Pontine Nursery and the client over there at 57 uh, Chestnut Street. Um, can you hear me all right? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, we're. I think we might be a little bit ahead of um, what we're trying to do here since we are awaiting um, engineering inspections and a set of as built uh, septic plans for what's currently in the field as of right now we have nothing on paper that identifies expansion areas and things like that um, for the property all we have is a tank location um, we assume it's a cesspool um, but we're not 100 percent sure what exactly lies beneath the ground um, we've heard through the grapevine that expansion areas on the uh, southeast side i believe so to the right side of the property as viewing in the map. Um, so along the uh, Southeast property line is where we assume is the expansion area down by where the tank is off the back of the bill, bill goes uh, down lower by the house, by the main residence. So you see, we have, our, we have our area right there, approximate septic tank location. And we believe that the expansion field is down towards where it says two story frame down in that in that vicinity uh, where the backyard wasn't you know planned for as to be the expansion area um the only other reasoning we have behind that is because the garage was put in um i believe i want to say between the 50s and the 70s when the garage went up um no no worry about it going over to that side so that's again and we also put the pool you know favoring the garage line um but still being able to meet our setbacks and maintain a fence buffer so the fence meets the setbacks and the pool meets the setbacks and um we're, we're giving some breathing room for the um for the property line there no but, but we don't have we don't have you have to have the location of septic because there are board of health regulations how far it has to be from the pool but we need we needed an overhead shot of like the adjacent buildings, and um, we took a quick look at this with Michael Gee and Ryan last week, and it appears that the left side of the pool is the parking lot for the law office, and the right side, the house is all the way up front in the street, so the pool's nowhere near that house. Right. But it is right up against the house to the north of it. David Kane's house, which is not, you need to have a parcel access or Google Earth view of it. See the house sure. is right at the pool. So we need some more uh, answers about from the Board of Health. Um, and we also need, I went by there and there was just uh, you know trees when you look across uh, the little office parking lot. There's certain regulations about fencing, heights, the pool yep. surrounded by fence decks, a pool house, and so on. Um, and I'd like some input from the board, how they feel about this, even though we're not ready yet, because you don't have enough information to proceed. Right. Yeah. And we we just did the um we just did the pool install over at 22 Chestnut Street as well. And we we had similar <laughs> similar types of issues that we were able to accommodate, but you know we're we're quickly on the agenda here. So Ryan wanted us to uh, pop in anyway, uh, just to meet and greet and uh, discuss anything else. Just like the um, the parcel um, overhead shots that you'd like. So whatever else that you could recommend, wanting in the package aside from knowing that we need to come back with an engineer plan and board of health letter, um, just notes from whatever else the the board would like to see. Um, just it should be noted that. You know, the pool fence was brought in away from the property line to distract line of sight from neighboring properties, as well as um, their, you know, Pondside Nursery, who is the landscaper on the site, they're doing an overhaul on uh, shrubs, trees, things like that. So the, the whole mindset is to um, be able to absorb sound of what's going on in the backyard, as well as uh, limit the site. So I could probably get a... Um, more detailed landscape plan from them as well to overlay on a 
site plan. Right, that would be good because the, the Kane property to the north um, would have to have some fencing screening to give them some privacy. They're the only ones that really are are of the of the adjacent houses are right. You know, right. By it that. looks like to me this is like an old survey. This isn't an updated one, is it? With just your pool put in it, or is no, this I mean, is I'm, just I'm, I, there's an old survey that I overlaid the pool with the uh, right. That's what I, I thought know, because I, I went by the other day and it's looked like there's a very substantial, a very nice fence that seems to go around the whole property in the rear. But that's not what this is showing. Uh, so a landscape right, well, uh, existing right. in a proposed landscaping and you know that would help. And the other things, when you go next door to the neighbors and you knock on the door and you say, this is what I'm proposing, how do you feel about it? And they're willing to either, you know, say, I got no problem with it or, you know, that's great or I don't like this at all. I mean, you know, that right. helps you and us. Right. And the, and the, the owner, the owner has, and the, the landscaper also has um, discussed this with the neighbors. We, we all, we currently have a letter from the business to the, to the West there, which is allowing, who is allowing um, us to use their parking lot for access to the property during uh, construction, assuming that a, uh, a permit is granted. Okay. That's nice of them. Yes. Whatever neighbor support you can get. Especially yep. from the neighbor to north, you know, Mr. Kane. Yeah, on the north side there. Not going to have a problem because he's the closest to the pool. All right. So you, you, uh, any other board member have any questions or comments or, or uh, information that Mr. O'Brien should bring when they come back? I have a short wish list of some things that I'd love to just see on the plan and understand this a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose for starters, just the location of the pool equipment pad um seeing that on the site where it's going to be in relation to the pool in relation to the property lines yep no um problem. i assume outdoor filtration and heater um yep. but just cartridge filter um plan to go right behind the garage and use the electrical service off of the garage okay and then uh propane yeah propane heat yep. and is there a location for that tank is it is it above ground tank or are you going to be using an in-ground tank it, it, I'm not sure at the moment what they have existing on site. Um, if it was above ground, it would be uh, two to 150 uh, gallon uh, tanks. They sit about four and a half feet high, um, easily covered. But those would go onto the east side of the garage and then covered with shrubbery. OK, so that would that would be helpful just to see on the, the landscape plan or the site plan of some sort, just to know no problem. what the idea is, even if you haven't figured out exactly the tank sizing yet. Right. Um, also just pool deck. I see you've got what looks to be two foot coping all the way around. Is there any other plan for a pool deck around? Um, they're talking about some, uh, bluestone pavers in, uh, in a stone dust. So a dry laid application, uh, that would likely go on the east side of the property, maybe like, uh, a, a little, a eight foot bump out for some chairs or something of the sorts, but, uh, there's nothing definitive yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, you have to be careful of lot coverage. Because you've got yeah. a house, you have a garage, then you have a pool, then you have a deck. Um, you have to check the uh, check with the zoning enforcement officer about what counts and what doesn't count in lot coverage. Right, and, permanent structures versus yeah. Right, a propane any ground propane tank, a pool, a pool house to house the equipment. You're Maybe, some to get up there. Hmm? Maybe some solar. Maybe some solar. Yeah. Yeah, instead of having a little shady area, put a pergola uh, with, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Some solar panels, non-glare, non-glare panels. Non-glare um, panels. And then just a couple other items. One would be, you know, just some some sort of narrative, just a presentation even next time you come back on how you plan to deal with dewatering and backwashing and things like that. Um, where I'm heading with that is just sort of any impacts, any adverse impacts on neighboring parcels. From sure. from what I could tell, you're slightly elevated, and this is just from a drive by, mm -hmm. just slightly elevated above the neighboring parking lot. So mm -hmm. it does seem like there is some potential for water to run downhill, and you know, weekly backwashing might be one thing. But thoughts for dewatering if you had to drain the pool and replaster or make a repair or something like that. If there's going to be some sort of pit used. Uh, in conjunction with the pool, that would right. be interesting to know. 
and right. also see how that affects proximity to septic and expansion area and things of the like. Got it. And then to the extent the landscape architect can include this would be, I think, just helpful to see any large trees that might be impacted. It doesn't look like, again, from a drive-by, there's a whole lot of large trees in the yard, but I would just be curious to see if, um, and as a, we evaluate this and the neighbors make their comments, just to see if there's any large trees impacted and, and what the mitigation is in terms of other shrubs and trees that might be planted. And sure. it's, again, it's not something I'm sure we can write, I'm fully sure we can regulate, but I just would like to understand it a little bit better. Right, absolutely, and I, I think there there were some trees coming down already because of um, sickness in the trees or and and um, insurance reasons, the uh, the age of the tree and how sturdy it is. Um, but as far as the placement of the project, it was put in, but just like you said, you drive by and you don't notice that anything's going to be, you know, extremely affected by what we're doing. Um, but you know, to, to have a better bearing of, you know, where the root systems lie and, you know, what's staying and what's going. Absolutely. And just yeah. even shade on the pool and things like that tend to come up in these situations. Okay. So let Ryan know when you're ready to come back. We're having another meeting at the end of the month. We're changing the date. We'll talk about that at the end. Um, and then uh, we'll see you then. Right. So is, is the current survey we're working with, is this going to be... Um, okay to move forward with if we have an engineer overlay for the septic? Well, I think you should have on the site plan the, the things that Darren was talking about as well as um, existing vegetation uh, so that we can gauge if there's adequate screening. I would like to see fence details as to what sort of fence you're putting up, how high it is, what it's made out of. Right. Um, and if there's existing fence, mark that on there so that we have have a sense of, you know, what can be seen from the neighbor's yard and what can't. Right, absolutely. It will, um, I'll be able to produce that. 3D renderings as well. We can do that. We did that with the uh, 22 chestnut over there. Um, but my, the question was more so on this particular survey, it's an old dated survey. Are we still okay with using this to define property lines and things like that, knowing that we're going to have a more comprehensive plan that's defining and depicting the um, all the items in question? So we don't have to get the place resurveyed. A, a, an engineer no. overlay on this. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can use this as a base map. Okay, great. Great. You said it better than I did. <clears throat> Okay, well, let Ryan know when you'll be ready to come back. Okay, one, wonderful. Yes. One last, one last thing for the board. Uh, does the board feel that a public hearing is necessary for this? Oh. I think pools and backyards is a good idea to have a public hearing. But I don't know if, we, if we've done it in the past. I can't remember. <laughs> I, hmm. I don't remember if we did it for 22 Livingston or not. I think we did for the one on uh, Montgomery Street there. Well, I think 22, I gave you a pretty comprehensive plan and we, we got through that, but I think we got through not doing the public hearing on 22 because we were also already in touch with the uh, church in the back there on the back side of their property. Um, the client was in direct communication with them to make sure that mitigation measures were uh, set in place in the it would certainly help we had a letter from Mr. Kane. He's right, the right. One. The business, it's a business on the left side is a business, and you're facing the parking lot. The other one, the neighbor's house is all the way up front where your house is, quite a distance from the pool. It's Mr. Kane who's most affected. Well, how about a letter from all adjoining neighbors? Yeah, I don't think it hurts to have a public hearing on this one um, and all pools from now on. I just, I think that's, yeah, I was on these sort of small lots, so relatively small lots. Uh, and if nobody shows up, it goes quickly. <laughs> but, you know, if you don't schedule it and you don't get the, the letters, then you have to wait another two weeks to keep going. Right, <laughs> right, right. We've done I think it, we do a public hearing and if nobody objects, we can move forward with site plan approval. So it doesn't really hold up the project per se if we ask for a public hearing. Great. And if nobody comes. So you need to let, um, well, will you be ready 
on the 27th of September to come back? I doubt it because the um, engineer isn't scheduled to go on the site until I think it's like the 18th of the month. Oh. So by the time we get something back from him, it puts us into that time right there. And then we have to put together a comprehensive plan. All right. So we'll Mr. Chair, do you want to schedule this public hearing for October 18th? It should be ready by then. Yeah. Yeah, let's get let's have a public hearing October 18th. We haven't officially told everyone the schedule yet, but I guess this is as good a time as any. Um, the uh, village board needed our time slot uh, the third Tuesday of September. So we got bumped till the 27th of September. It made no sense to have a second planning board meeting the following Tuesday on October 3rd. So Ryan and I decided to let that one go. So we'll be meeting in three weeks on September 27th and three weeks after that on October 18th. So we can schedule a public hearing. That'll give the gentleman, Mr. O'Brien, six weeks to come back with a plan. So I just need a motion, Chair. Okay, I'll make a motion to have a public hearing for the pool at 57 Chestnut Street on October 18th. Do we have a second? Second, Darren. Okay. All those in favor, Darren? Aye. Michael? Aye. John? Aye. Jeff? Aye. And David? Aye. Okay. It's approved. We'll see you hopefully with, with good enough plans for the 18th. And Ryan will notify the associated neighbors to see if they. But I totally agree with John Clark. We have another pool coming up on Livingston Street, and we should have public hearings on pools. Okay. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is a modification. 46 Livingston Street came to us. We did a site visit. We approved uh, the changes to the, the back stairs, and uh, they're making a slight change to their approval. And uh, they're coming back tonight to go over what their changes are. Hi, uh, I'm here. Shay and Mark, okay. Yeah. So, um, Ryan has, uh, I don't know if that's Ryan or Shay. Um, right. So what they said is the original proposal included moving the door to the mudroom a few feet west to better line up with the interior door and expanding the back landing to width of 13 feet and a depth of five feet with a 16 inch step extending it along its length with railings on either side. Now the doors moved, they had a photo that you showed. We looked at it last week, Mark Michael and I met at our pre-meeting. And they want to make uh, the landing a little larger. All of this is still behind the house and behind the fencing on both sides of it. Cannot be seen from the street. But let's uh, look at what um, they're proposing. So that's the uh, the current state with the door moved. Say there. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. That, that's the current state with the door moved to the left. Right. That's it. That's all we've done. So we moved the door over. It used to be um, where the we just swapped out where those two windows are and moved the door over so that we didn't have to keep going around on this little dog leg kind of pattern with the door over by the fence. So now instead of those two steps, you want to widen it to have a platform there. Yeah, exactly. Just a long, you know, this kind of space between the gate of the fence and the back of the house is sort of just underutilized the way it is right now. And so we had originally just proposed something going across the whole mud room, like which is 13 feet long 
and having it like five feet wide. And now we're just proposing to make it a little longer to better use that space, make it nine feet wide with a 16 inch stair that wraps around both the, you know, the both sides, the south side of it. And um, I guess the um, west side so that you can just step up from any direction. So, right. Do any of the board members have questions about this? I know Darren wasn't on our site visit. Yeah, I wasn't on the site visit as well. So this is, I'm still trying to figure this thing out. So the roof is being extended or just the steps? It's just, it's just basically, it's the landing for the stairs in back of the house that's going to be lengthened into like sort of a small deck across the back of the house, which, you know, right now it's just the width of the doorway and quite awkward. So it, that wasn't original to the house either. It was added at some later time. So we just, our idea was to just expand it into a small patio and then surround it with like bluestone to, you know, to make it into like a more usable area. So the existing enclosure with the windows and the move door is staying the same and you're just extending the, the steps and a deck yeah. off, the, off the south mm -hmm. side of it. Well, That's right, step, exactly. One step down to this deck and a second step down to the grass. It's no snow steps down to the deck. It's just, it's you step straight out from the mud room and that's level. And then you step one de step down. Oh, is that what you meant? And then one step down and then the step. So it's just one step. Nice. Yeah. Got it. And it's behind the, the total step. height is like 29 inches off the ground for the height of where it comes, where the doorway comes out. So you have to go down one step. And it's mm -hmm. behind the house and between the two fences. So all of this yeah. is not visible to anybody except the bird up in a tree. Mm -hmm. So that's um, right. Nobody's going to see any of this. And it's not changing any of the house. I mean, we had already moved the door. That's the only aspect of the actual touching the architecture of the house that we had done. And yeah, and we maintain the same look. It's just that the door was in a more convenient spot. So share the doors, the is the arc there at the bottom of the screen, the back of house, that's where the door has been moved to. Exactly, so we're looking at, yeah. Right. All right, could you bring the picture back of what of the current condition? Yeah. So you see where the ladder is there in those little those windows there, that's where the door was, and we moved it over. And the ladder would now be on the new porch if it was built. <laughs> right. I hope the we ladder, get rid of that junk pile go like when we cat. actually build something. <laughs> so I'm sorry that looks like such a mess. But um, but yeah, I just want to say, yeah, the door, the door was with those where those there was one long panel there, and then the door fit right where those two windows were. Let's see, and then we moved it over so that it lines up with the back door. The black door is goes into the house. But so we're not changing any of that. It's just that little landing there that we want to kind of expand uh, into that area. It seems fine with me. Yeah. Anybody have any comments? Seems straightforward. No, it's it seems to make a lot of sense. I was on the original uh, site visit, and um, yeah, it seems to make sense to me. I agree. Yeah, I think it makes a little bit more functionality just having dirt there and it's not visible to anyone. So right. I don't have a problem with it. Michael? No, I'm fine. Looks fine. Everybody else okay? Good. Well, okay. to approve as I proposed. The amendment to their site plan. Yes. So the 46 levels is a, a, a second. I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor, Darren? Aye. Michael? Aye. Jeff? Aye. John? Aye. And David? Aye. Okay, good luck, guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks Thank for you. looking at it again. Okay. Okay, the next one is um, 
47 West Market Street, which is the big building across from the spa. They had a vacant space in the back, and now they are renting it to as a professional office, um, acupuncture and chiropractor. And so what we know what 47 West Market looks like, the tie and bond, the village uh, engineer is in there. And this was unused space in the building. Certainly have no problem parking. There's a giant parking lot there. Is um, mental health not in there anymore? No. Nope. No, they moved a while ago over to uh, uh, the hospital grounds. I don't know if they're still oh, there. That's right. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah, so these are strictly, you know, there's tie and bond and there's an accountant in the back and then there's empty space. You'll be behind them. Yeah. And, and some, where were the entry for this? Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. This or the entry for this suite would be on the tie and bond side of the building? No, the uh, entry would be right next to Grady, the accounting business. Okay. Right, right off the parking lot. Is there any signage? There will be signage, and we'll get to that after you've approved us as okay. a business. Do we need any? This was a it was a professional office. It's going to be a professional office. Is that no change of use, Ryan? Professional office, medical office is a permitted use. Okay. So anybody have any questions? Is this uh, site plan in compliance? I know we've had troubles in the past with this building in terms of promised landscaping and things like that that haven't happened. It's It looks much better than it used to, uh, but I just wanted to make sure everything's okay with the building. I would say to answer that in a yes or no, no, but I spoke with Carl Carter Hastings, the site manager the other day, and he was supposed to have a proposal from Malcarney Landscaping to come up with um, a different version of the six to eight dead and dying trees. And he is aware that uh, his landscape is in poor health and he, he says he wants to address it. It's kind of vague. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I think at some point maybe we'll have to like bring them in and say, what are you, you know, what's your plan? Because it's not in compliance and it is improved vastly from years ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was over there striping the um, parking lot the other day. Um, the pergola has gone? No, not the pergola, the, the, what do you call it? Gazebo. He, he told us a couple of years ago, <laughs> it was going to be moved last year, still there. Um, and the dumpster enclosures? The dumpster, is a, that's a nice dumpster enclosure. Uh, and it's it's maintained. Um, it's, it's vastly improved from <laughs> 10, 10 years ago. It's, it's not perfect. I mean, in front next to Samus, there's two dead hemlocks. They've been dead. Next to me, there's uh, two or three dead hemlocks. One of them's been there dead for two or three years. Um, there's another two that are almost dead. And then the village on Oak Street planted a uh, Oak Street right next to the corner. And his maintenance people chopped the hell out of the roots, of, uh, the, the bark at the bottom. And that's just about dead. So <laughs> it's just basically um, trees need to be replaced for screening. Well, it's and I would also say he's got, a, he's got a sign in the front that was there uh, that was when the county owned it. And... It's, you know, he's replaced the sign above it with his sign that says parking for 47 West only, you know, you'll be towed. But he's left this rusty paint fading old county sign. So I think we should ask that that be removed. Well, it's only when an applicant comes to us that wants us to approve something, that we have the opportunity to point out deficiencies in the property that we'd like corrected. So. If, if we, as we approve this business, 
um, it's our opportunity to put some conditions on it. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, this this gentleman is a tenant. He's, oh, I know that. He has no ownership uh, to the property. Um, possibly this might be a better avenue for these concerns to be expressed to the uh, code enforcement officer for a letter to be sent to uh, Mr. Hastings as the site manager and Mr. Colnagy as the pro as the property owner. So we've had this issue many times when someone's moving into a, a multiple use building that the landlord who owns the multiple use building hasn't followed through um, with what they were supposed to do. And we don't want to hurt the, the tenant because it's not their fault, but it's an opportunity to make a comment or a letter to um, the CEO about this. Can, can Michael, can you get something to Ryan about you? You're, you're most familiar with this. Yeah, I sent Ryan pictures of, of the trees and I can, I can send him an email about things. You know, we can, we can establish a timeline of the board of, you know, springtime, you know, you need to, you know, bring this up to, uh, what we'd like to see by, you know, I would say the spring. I mean, we, we just approved, uh, you know, next to co there, you know, the front of them, the tax shop, we gave them till right. next year to do their landscaping, you know. So if you can get a letter, if you can get some information to Ryan that he can forward to Ken, we could at the next meeting, perhaps vote on something. I have a motion on, on pertaining to this property of uh, uh, improvements that were promised and didn't take place that we'd like to have them, you know, by next spring corrected, you know, something like that. Right. Ken, Ken can tell us what to do. Yeah, I don't think he needs us to do it if it's if it's already uh, on the site plan, but if it's not, right. then, but I, I agree we shouldn't hold the tenant to the no, issue. No. And Come up. getting a tenant in there will help uh, him Justify paying for the improvements. Right. <laughs> we, we've had this in, with many different properties. We've had the problem that the landlord is non compliant. The tenant comes in, wants to do something. The landlord says, I uh, give permission for this new tenant to move in. And it's our chance to take some action up against the non compliant landlord. So if you could do that for us, Michael, that would be appreciated. Okay. okay so, uh, did we make a motion to approve this? You did not, Chair. Okay. It's a long night. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve um, the professional office moving into 47 West Market Street with them coming back in the future for sign approval? I made that. I just made the motion. We have a second. I'll second, Darren. Okay. Thank you. A roll call vote, Darren. Aye. Okay. Michael? Aye. Jeff? Aye. John? Aye. And David? Aye. Okay. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have one. Yeah, I have, I have a question for you. Um, I, yeah, I, I thank you for taking action with the property. Uh, I didn't personally, when I've been there, I haven't even noticed the dead trees because I was focused more on the building, the parking and the interior of the building and trying to create a floor plan that would work for us. So, uh, and, but I would like it to be, you know, compliant and I would like it to be attractive and I'd like it to be safe. So yes. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So uh, the last item on the agenda is 29 Beach Street, a recommendation for uh, an area variance, positive or negative, for a carport on the side of the building. And it's in the historic district on 29 Beach Street. Do we have the applicant and do we have? We have uh, the yes. representing agent, uh, Charles Wiles from Wiles Construction. Okay, do we have some uh, 
pictures, Ryan, of what of what the applicant wants to do. So this is the house, and on the left side of the building, um, you want to put some kind of a carport without solar panels, I assume. Or with that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, that, you're right. That's what we were proposing with uh, no solar panels. So um, this is a house on the historic register. Um, it's going to be close to the the neighbor. What do we got here? Propane tank, septic tank. Where is the carport? It's on the left. That's it. Thirty-five Correct. feet back, wrapping around the building. It's only going to be some columns. It's within. So the problem is, uh, because of the width of a car, I guess it's four feet into the setback. Correct. And it's going to look pretty much like that one with the solar panels, a, a lean-to like structure. Can you show the um, picture from the street of what that side of the house looks like? Uh, yeah, Ryan, I think, can do that. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Thank you. So I, when when I saw this on the agenda, I in my mind was thinking that um, there would be something like what other applicants have called a port co share that came off the side of the building. But I see there's already uh, something in the back of the building there that's it's kind of a, a very low pitched slanting roof. So, uh, and I can't tell from the drawings, there's, there's no elevations of the proposed carport to show us what, what you have in mind, how it would fit with the house, how it would fit with this very low, looks, almost looks like a covered porch existing in the back now. I really can't get a sense for what's being proposed without some elevations. Well, that one elevation is there. If if we went back to the um, the floor plan, what? all right. So um, maybe it's the next page, Ryan. That's how many. It's open and it's just yes. a bunch of columns. Yes. Holy so it'd be God. pretty much, let's see. So it's back, go up a oh. Yeah, okay, there's the front elevation right there. So it would actually marry in, uh, I guess he's got that blown up pretty big so you can't quite get a sense of how it's attaching to the house, but and it's a grainy picture. So it goes uh, behind the second window. Correct. And we would attach it to the existing um, roof line. And so it'd be, you, anyway, I did meet with the zoning enforcer and the building inspector. They were calling it like a breezeway. You know, it's a carport. We wanted to call it carport, but one could also call it a breezeway. But it's a connection onto the exist, existing structure that you see from the back. So it yeah. looks to me like what's being proposed. You have this wraparound uh, porch on the back, and you're going to take out that corner column uh, near the driveway right. and extend the roof of the existing uh, porch over the driveway so that you can pull a car underneath it. Is am I relatively correct on that? No, you're exactly right. So and you maintain the existing roof line of the existing porch 
and just extend it over the driveway. You'll take out that corner column so you can pull the car up a little farther forward and you'll bring down the, the deck to the driveway in that corner as well. Right, the de that corner of the existing deck we would take out. Right. So we, so we could bring the car back as far as possible from the street and shoot. But it's, so the structure wouldn't have to be any bigger than it has to be because it's really to protect your car during the winter months. Right, it's 12 by 16, which is about as small as a carport could be. Um, and the well, only problem I, is, is you have the existing driveway is too close to the property line. So you need an area of areas for four feet in order to accomplish this. Will it have the same quality of workmanship and woodwork as the existing porch? Yes. I think that needs to be represented on that drawing. That drawing is too crude for interpretation as to what we're being, what's being approved. So you have to have something that sort of looks like what you see on the left-hand side of the screen, only looking from the driveway, looking forward. So we can see what it looks like from the street. And the picture from, from the street, street, it looked as though the roof on the existing porch was a very shallow sloped roof. Here, it looks like a flat roof. Um, so, well, I, sorry, I, um, I do want to increase the uh, slope of the roof and I have it labeled here, it's a four on 12. So that means four inches of rise for every foot of run. My worry is if I put a flat roof there and the snow slid off the house that, um, you know, I could create a problem there. So I would like to have some, a, a slightly better pitch slope what roof. About, what about drainage? Because you, you know, the water is going to come off just six feet from the neighbor's property. And that could be a potential problem. Are you envisioning a gutter or a way to get the water away from the property line? Sure, we could put a gutter there. I don't actually think we'd be creating any more water because the driveway is pitched already that way. So oh, whatever water is going toward that property line is still going to be the same, in my opinion. Well, we want to improve things if you're going to, you know, we just don't want flooding on on neighbors' properties. No, I, I'm very sensitive to that. I can't create anything you know, a hardship for them, but so a gutter, there is a, there it doesn't show it on this plan here. There is an existing gutter on the existing porch and we would be putting gutters on the new carport. And directing it towards the back as opposed to the side. Correct. Ryan, can we just zoom out and just look at the plan view of this for a second? I think it's on the same sheet. There was a, there we go. I was under the impression you guys all got you got the um, plans PDF before that didn't really we did yeah it's, okay. it's not very clear right okay and the table on the right needs to be corrected because it doesn't point out the need for a variance there so the side yard variance should say proposed you know. Um, six feet rather than 10, which is required. So when, when, okay. you, when you say that uh, you want to have a, a four inch roof, a four, four, four over 12 um, run roof, where would that attach to the house? And does that mean you're taking that portion, the rear portion of the existing porch roof off? I, I don't see if it's a continuation of the existing sloped porch roof, then by the time you got all the way 12 feet over, that it would be pretty low, wouldn't it? Well, yeah. Um, well, let's take away when we say continuation. It is a a continuation of the porch but the roof that protrudes out toward that window would be going at a steeper pitch because that's where it's actually uh, underneath the house. 
in the back where the uh, porch roof is, is not underneath the house. So therefore, uh, there isn't a concern about snow coming off the roof and falling on that yeah. porch. Yeah, Ryan, can you go back to the photo from the street that shows yeah. the left side of the house down the driveway? Yeah, thank you. So here, here's my point that the, the existing port, there's a, there's a slightly sloped roof that Correct. the existing porch is there. And John's pointed out, it sounds like you want to take the corner, at least that first post and the corner off of there. But does that mean that you're not, the roof of this proposed carport is not going to match the slope of the existing screened uh, uh, covered porch? And if so, then what's the plan? Is the plan to put a, a sloped roof between the upper and lower windows and and continue that slope roof all the way to the end of the existing um, porch, which would change no. the roof line of that porch. I would just be just where we're from the corner of that gutter there. I, you have a pointer, yeah. yeah. Right yeah. from that corner to like this window here where the fence is, that's where the, the uh, slope of the roof would increase. But that's but I don't not, have to uh, increase it, uh, you know. I mean, I'm, and I, then you can see the gutter that's there. I don't have to increase it. I just feel it would be uh, a stronger construction. But the car can't fit between the window and the gutter. You have the cars to go into that porch part of it. Yeah, it has to. It has to go to like that second uh, post in order to get the car in there so are you going to partially demolish the porch bring the bring the area of the porch roof back and then have a second roof line for the uh, additional carport that's not attached to the existing roof line of the porch no it'd all be married together what would it have to we'd have to put like a saddle so the extension of the porch breezeway the extension would have an increased slope of the roof and then the way we marry the two together i'd have to have a a uh, what they call a saddle or a cricket could even have step flashing there but it'd have to be a transition from one roof to the other if that would be allowed or if it's like you say if it's if if the board wants us to just keep that exact same roof line, there would be enough room because the porch is up uh, about, I don't know exactly the same for it. I'm thinking it's close to 12 inches up. So the car, you know, we have another 12 inches of headroom there because the car is just going to stay right on the, the driveway. I, I think, um... Right now, we're just doing a recommendation on the variance. And when, if and when you get the variance, you would come back for uh, site plan approval to this board. And by then, probably for the ZBA meeting as well, so you could explain all this, you would have to have a better drawing from this angle showing how the roof is going to attach to the building, how it's going to um, marry up with the, ex the existing porch roof where it's going to end on the driveway, what the posts are going to look like um, so that we can get a sense of it. Um, so for the ZBA meeting, I would recommend that. And if not, then certainly for the site plan drawing um, coming back to us, we would want to have better elevations so that we know exactly how this thing is going to look from the front. Right. And we'd like to see the columns that you see from the street look like the columns on the front porch so it looks like it's always been there. Instead of just putting up a six by six post, it would look much better if the columns looked something like the columns on the house. So it looked like it's always been there. It's on the historic register and it's viewable from the street. So um, the, the, the problem that we're having is we just had a problem with uh, another, another recommendation that we just gave. 
the way the code is written, a planning board without any input from the public or anybody else has to make a recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals based on just, in this case, the four feet that the variance is for. Um, for the most part, if it looks reasonable to us, we don't, we're not looking at landscaping at the slope of the roof or the columns or windows or anything. We're just looking at this thing being in the variance as it makes sense to us to recommend it to the ZBA. When they get to the ZBA, it's that point that they chime in, neighbors come in, neighbors make comments because they get a notification to all neighbors within a certain number of feet in all directions. And they came in, and in the last variance we recommended, there was a lot of problems at the Zoning Board of Appeals, and they want the neighbors had complaints about it. So unfortunately, the way the code is written today, our job is to make a variance recommendation, positive or negative, with very little information, except the way it seems to us, without getting input. And now this, uh, the applicant comes back, we're going to have to have a public hearing at the planning board and then go to the zoning board for a second public hearing in front of them because there were a lot of neighbors who were concerned and wanted to know why the planning board made this positive recommendation when uh, we didn't know what the neighbors were going to think. For the most part, the neighbors don't make a lot of comments. This time they did. And we can't change any procedures right now, but... Right. Um, I, I, you know, I'm kind of concerned about how we don't have any letters. Have you contacted the neighbors on the? Yeah, road? I'd like to. I'd like to address that. We have talked to the Queens, and they, uh, they are the ones to the uh, north, just to the left of the driveway you're looking at. They're fine with it, and we've contacted the person right across the street which I don't know her the name of that person, but so we've contacted two, uh, Pete Belvin or Lauren Belvin has spoke personally to both of them. So yes, we might have to change our procedures if we can do this in the future, not for this case, but when someone wants to come to the planning board for a recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals, perhaps we don't want to have the trouble of two public hearings, but we could require the applicant asking for the variance to contact the neighbors and get letters of opinion from the neighbors. I'm not sure whether that's allowed. We have to talk to someone about that. But um, so, uh, I, 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 so, yeah, Miss, so, so, hold, 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 hold on, Char Char Charlie. I'm just going to, you know, present some, um, you know outside inf information here just for the board to consider um right now um this application depending on how the board proceeds to tonight would not be seen by the zba until october so the planning board has the opportunity again to see this applicant again if the board feels that it is more comfortable to see a better or clearer depiction of what the front elevation is going to be uh, for this proposed carport. Um, that opportunity can take place on September 27th, and there would be still enough time um, for the applicant to be seen uh, by the Z ZBA in October on October 20th. Right, because the, the, for those of you who are not familiar, and Ryan's working on minutes, um, there were major issues with our five to zero positive recommendation for 56 Livingston Street. The neighbors did not like what uh, uh, was proposed. There are a lot of comments, 13 people spoke out making comments about it, um, and we didn't have that input. So we thought to us, it looked good. For instance, whenever anybody adds a second floor to a garage or expands a second floor to the building, we like to have input to say that we don't want any windows facing the neighbor so it invades their privacy. And we've had several cases over the years 
where neighbors have said, I don't want windows looking down at me. It happened on a property in East Market Street last year. It's happened on Livingston. And this time, the neighbor said, I don't want to look at a monolith. I want windows. I have shades. I want windows when I look out my window so it doesn't look like a giant monolith. So there were several other issues as well. And the problem with the way the code is currently structured, we don't get to have the full picture. I spoke to a member of the ZBA. Well, you didn't consider runoff and drainage from the new structure. You didn't look at the windows. I said, we're going to look at everything when the applicant comes back for site plan approval. All we are looking at is the footage of the variance and whether that seems reasonable to us. So I'm trying to figure out a way in the future to make it easier for the applicant that when somebody comes to the planning board for this positive or rec negative recommendation, where we're basically flying blind other than our gut feeling about precedent in the past, the way neighbors have reacted in the past. Um, uh, it was the house on, you know, Rachel's house on Livingston Street. She bumped out into the existing setback in line with the building and nobody objected to that. It seemed reasonable to us and it was approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. This time, what seemed reasonable to us was not reasonable to the neighbors. So now it's being kicked back to the planning board to start the process all over again with the revised plan and a recommendation to the ZBA. I'm trying Mr. to figure, like, streamline this. So, so that's that's all tentative. So separate yes, from that to so, steering back to the applicant yes. and the application. The so board has that good. opportunity for more um, site plan and design at this mo mo moment. We uh, right. so hopefully the board will vote. The applicant has the opportunity to return on September 27th with front elevations, with a drainage plan, with design standards that normally you guys don't look at until final site plan approval. You guys right. have the opportunity now to address those prior to the ZBA in October. So the only change I would propose is that when an applicant comes for a recommendation for, for, for the ZBA, we jump ahead to try to smooth things out by asking the applicant to contact the neighbors. And if we can get some notes from the neighbors at our uh, vote, we'll have better information. If the neighbors are not going to object, what we think is reasonable, they think is reasonable, it would help smooth out the process not that we could vote five to nothing and 13 neighbors speak at the Zoning Board of Appeals public hearing and now it gets picked, kicked back. So I'm trying to avoid that in the future. If anyone else has any opinions about this, I think since Mr. Wiles is coming back on the 27th with uh, um, clearer plans, it might help if he had some of these notes from the neighbors to say they think this looks good and they don't object to it. That would certainly help with the Zoning Board of Appeals. We always ask people to go to the neighbors before they go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. It might help if they came to us so we have more information before we make our vote. Does that sound reasonable to the board? Let's just talk about this application and we'll have a discussion at the end of the meeting as to changes and procedures. I think it's fine to ask the applicant to come back at the next planning board meeting with better plans and then we'll vote on whether we agree with the setback or not and and it can get on the zba agenda in october okay yeah i would uh i'll just add to that i i would want to see uh much clearer plans with elevations from from the different sides and in truth um that would be something that it would be helpful for the applicant to take to the neighbors because you know to go to the neighbors and say we're asking for a four foot relief on the setback you know you really should show them what you're going to show us right. um so i i would want to see uh, the elevations and the details of how this thing will end up looking before we um, consider it uh before we consider recommending one way or the other to the uh, ZBA. 
So kind of a make chicken and egg thing. Mr. Wiles, does this make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. I guess what um, I felt, well, I fell short in a couple different ways here. I thought it was really just uh, applying for the side yard setback variance. And so I didn't really work that hard on the plan and the presentation at this point. So th that's where my uh, presentation has fallen short. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come back the 27th and I'll show a gutter on it, the, the front elevation, and we'll have a few notes from the neighbors. Thank you. Uh, I think this will help you with us and it will help you with the Zoning Board of Appeals when you go to them. Right. So that, and then uh, I guess on the 27th, not that I get, get ahead of myself, but I, get, I guess then we would be get, able to get on the agenda for a public hearing then. Uh, not a public hearing, just um, we'll vote on the uh, various recommendation on the 27th. And you'll, so will I have a public hearing? The no? public hearing will be at the ZBA meeting. Right, in October. We That's a separate board and a separate meeting, Charlie. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, sure. Charlie, from and my just, perspective. Yeah, go ahead. Just um, across the street, when Eric Lynch was doing his thing, there was a lot of concern from the neighbor to the south about the drainage because the houses are so close and we had a lot of discussion of where gutters were going and where the dry wells were going to be and soil testing. And, you know, it's, I, I think you have to be prepared if, if your neighbors aren't happy a year from now when, when snow load and water's going on their lawn, you know, we want to kind of nip that in the bud. So, you know, besides a gutter, where is the gutter going? What's the soil like? Do you have a dry well or do you not need it? You know, yeah, I think in this particular case, it's hard to make a recommendation positive or negative without a little more detail because it does seem like some of the details might influence the outcome of, of the proposed carport one way or the other. When it... no, you, you froze. <laughs> it gets back to us. And, you know, oh, did I freeze? Am I frozen yeah. or can everyone hear me? Hear you now. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how much of that you all heard. Oh, I think we got most of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think a couple of the significant factors with respect to this are one, it does appear to show an overhang even further than the proposed setback into the side yard property line. So I'm particularly just focused on the drainage aspects of that. It looks somewhere like 18 to 24 inches, which does put that water pretty far out into the neighbor's property and does drop that roof line a little bit further. So just some clarification on that would definitely help with the positive or negative recommendation. And then I do believe the way these roofs come together and some of the trim details might ultimately influence the ultimate shape and size of this carport. So I would be curious to see them at the next meeting, again, deciding whether or not to make a positive or negative recommendation, because I do see roof line and roof pitches and ultimate width of trim details affecting, again, the size of this. And I'm afraid we might send you for a variance that's too small or too large without some of those details. So I do like the idea of coming back another meeting before going to the ZBA. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Very, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, so I guess we're done. Yep. Okay. We're done okay. for tonight. Thank you. We'll, we'll see you on the 27th. Thanks. Thank Charles. you. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Bye. Thank you. So, so just, just, just I, to clarify, I just have one follow-up question for you, Ryan. In the last meeting, I had, had raised the question at the end of the meeting because there was a motion passed by the mayor and trustees claiming that the uh, the owner of the parcel uh, with the Bulkley School had had submitted an application for a demolition permit and we didn't see it. Um, and I thank you, Ryan, the very next day, what you sent out to us was the um, code enforcement officers determination uh, memo. But I see that this also says that they've submitted an application and 
and that uh, it should come to the planning board. So can I, what's best? Can I meet with you, Ryan? Um, and we can talk a little more about this because I, I still don't have an answer to whether they actually want a demolition permit application to be considered. Yes, Jeff, I think if we pick a day and a time yeah. okay. um, to better explore this um, and just chat about this, I think it would be uh, more appropriate then. Okay, yes, yes, absolutely. So I'll just, I'll just contact you. Whenever it's convenient for you, we can get together before too long. Thanks for that. What, what You're the welcome. Thing I'm trying to, was trying to struggle with here is that for years, We've never had a problem. We have some sort of standards that we go by making our, um, uh, with very little information, making our recommendations to uh, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals, positive or negative. And in the past, we've had many, we had one last year on East Market Street where the neighbor said, it's too close. You're building a second story on the garage. I only want buildings, windows on the three sides, not facing me. We've had that many times. We also have approved many times just uh, Rachel's house and houses before. If the variance was in line with an existing building that was in the setbacks, we sort of say, well, it's not intruding anymore. You can add to it. This time, the neighbor who was an architect said, I don't want a blank wall. I want windows. I want the 42 inches. I want the back of that building moved over. I don't want to put in line with the rest of them. So why does the planning board uh, uh, say five to nothing? It sounds fine to us because we have very little information. No input from the public, no input from anything. And I spoke to one member of the CBA. Why you didn't discuss drainage? Do you know that one of the windows was wider than it is high? And I said, we haven't got the site plan. We're only dealing with the variance. I'm trying to find out a way without changing the code to say, if you want a recommendation for a, for a variance, you have to have a public hearing at the planning board, followed a few weeks later by a public hearing at the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm trying to get better information so we make better recommendations to the Zoning Board of Appeals. That's all I'm trying to do here. Because See why it's a problem. We're only making a recommendation. The public weighs in with the ZBA. If the ZBA is, is swayed by the public and the neighbor's opinions, then they do not grant the variance or they do grant the variance. It well, still has to come back. It. The public can then weigh in on windows and drainage and that sort of thing when it comes back to the planning board. Well, they talked for two hours about this and they stopped. They said, we're not dealing with this. We're kicking this back to the planning board. So now I so, so, so hold on hold on chair so you were there Ryan I was not there I was there so in to be technical they are not kicking it back to the planning board they are kicking it back to themselves this is an applicant's decision on based on the feedback that they received at the zoning board of appeals meeting what they need to review and consider of the variance that they are asking for. So this right now, everything is in the applicants camp decision-making, working with their team of engineers and architect and deciding how they're gonna proceed from here. Now, if the applicant Un back and says- The applicant is not back. Obviously the applicant is not back because they've asked for more time and based on that time, we will get an answer because hypothetically, if they change anything, Chair, everything goes back to the starting line. They 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 have to re they have to come back to you. If they change anything in that variance, they have to come back to you guys. But what I'm saying is if they move it over 42 inches, no variance is required. Zoning Board of Appeals is gone. They can come to us next month and say, here we are. We want you to approve this site plan. And without any input from the 13 people that spoke at the Zoning Board of Appeals, we could say, okay, you moved it over. 
We don't want any windows because we don't know that the people objected to not having any windows. So we'll leave it as a solid wall and there's no variance needed. We'll approve the plan. After we look at drainage, windows, lighting, doors, we always ask for a public hearing as well. If exactly. We know that there's neighbor interest in this, we would ask for a public hearing on the site plan. Correct. So it's not like they wouldn't have an opportunity to talk to us before we made a decision. So now, we, yes, so what Ryan and I talked about is when they, when they come back, if they move it out of the way, don't require a variance, we have to have a public hearing because we now have the knowledge and Ryan is going to write up some of the discussion that happened at the Zoning Board of Appeal minutes. So we'll be aware of the discussion and then right. we have to vote to come back and have a public hearing at the planning board because we now have the knowledge the neighbors objected to our decision. And so, so the system works. Uh, hmm? So the system works as is. I, you know, I don't think we need to change the process. I, I think don't it's fine to, to, to advise applicants to talk to their neighbors beforehand. And if the neighbors want to weigh in before we make a recommendation, that's fine. But Ultimately, yes. the ZBA holds the public hearing on the variance and they get the input. That's exactly what I'm proposing, that we stretch our request a little bit. And when someone comes with a variance request to give us more knowledge, make it streamline them to go to the ZBA, that they get the input from the neighbors. If, if the neighbors had come or given us written things, the next door neighbor, especially who gets affected by it, I want the 42 inches. I totally object. I want the windows. I don't want a solid wall. I want those plans changed. It would have affected our vote of five to nothing in favor of it. So I'm trying to see if we can figure out a way without having two public hearings, ask the applicants if they want to, to get some rec show it to the neighbors and get some letters of approval or disapproval so we have more information we make the recommendation to the ZBA. That's all I'm proposing, not to public hearings, if that makes sense to everyone. We do that quite often. We, we suggest they talk to the neighbors. The problem is, is that then it requires them to wait two weeks to come back for a recommendation. Sometimes it's warranted, like the last case where the guy, we really didn't have good, good enough information for us to make a decision. But in most cases, it's, you know, it's, we have enough information to make a decision on a advisory recommendation. Uh, we don't necessarily need to string it out for two meetings in order to get a letter from somebody. Well, no, we don't have, I mean, if, if Ryan could suggest that yeah. when you submit this application to the planning board and come in for the recommendation, if you had some letters of support, it would help the planning board vote. That's, that's fine, I have no problem with that. Okay. Because the, the ZBA said, the planning board, what's the matter with them? How did they vote this five to nothing when clearly nobody wanted this because we didn't know that? Yeah, but they, they, <laughs> got, they got the decision right. They, they listened to the neighbors and the, the system works. You know, it's, it's not embarrassing to us to make an advisory committee that the one neighbor doesn't like or two neighbors or 13 neighbors doesn't like because we didn't have the final to say on the, on the, uh, on the variance. Right. And now that we know what the neighbors want, if they come back and they move it out and eliminate the variance, we're going to have to have a public hearing to let the neighbors weigh in to tell them we want the windows, we don't want this giant porch, or he, they objected to lots of different things about it um, that we, we'd have to talk about at our public hearing. So I think this will work with this one modification that Ryan can ask the applicant when they submit the application to try to contact the neighbors, it will help with both boards. That's all I'm suggesting as we change. I don't, have, I don't see a problem with that. And that's, it doesn't need to change to the code. No. Does that make but it sense? should be in writing when you contact the neighbors because when a, when a builder came in today and says he talked to the neighbors and they don't have a problem, that's hearsay. Right. We don't yeah, really right. know that. Yeah, yeah, they should write a letter to the board. Yeah. I agree. You don't have to. You don't have to. It's not. It's not a change in the code. But I think that. Uh, I think. I think we should take a lesson from this experience. And uh, I think it makes a lot of sense, as David is suggesting, for Ryan and the building department to say, when you come to us, and you're and you and you're asking for any kind of variance, 
um, strongly advise you to bring written documentation that you have reviewed your plans with your neighbors and uh, ask them to send in um, approvals. Remember how long it took to get through the slaby approval of those um, variances? And throughout that, they, they changed the uh, design several times for us before we finally approved the variances. And they did get, they did the right thing. They met with everyone. They met with the fire department even, and they got in information to us. So I, I agree with David, if, if, if Ryan could do that or the building department, it would be very helpful because the lesson I took from that is that from now on, I will look for that when someone comes asking for a variance. All right, it's getting late. Anybody have any other comments? We made it clear that we're going to meet on the 27th of September and the 18th of October. Chair, I need a motion, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> we need procedure here. I will uh, make a motion to uh, have our, uh, at the request of the village board, we move our, meeting from to the, to the 27th to the fourth Tuesday in September. And because we don't have to have a, um, a uh, two planning boards one week apart, we'll meet, we'll cancel the first meeting in October and meet on the third of, uh, October meeting on the 18th of October. That's my motion. Do we have a second? I'll second, second. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Michael we, I think got in there. We don't have to have a roll call vote. Just raise your hand. All those in favor, um, aye. Okay, Ryan, you happy? I I got it. <laughs> okay. Procedurally, we got it. We got it. Anybody have anything else? Uh, procedurally, right now, according to Hochul, this is our last Zoom unless she updates it. Uh, correct. And, and, and it was explained to me that she probably is going to do this a month at a time because if she doesn't have a public health emergency, it's not for us, then hospitals, doctor's offices, a lot of other public places can't require masks. So um, that was what was explained to me. But um, uh, I, I'm getting my Omicron booster on Monday. And so I will, and I, I, I will not be afraid to have public meetings. And uh, it apparently is up to each board. We can put in Ryan's announcement that the planning board agenda is coming up. Planning board meetings require you to come to Village Hall with a mask and we can put a sign on the door. You can open the window, sit 10 feet apart. Who knows what could happen this winter with a surge. But if Kathy keeps doing it, you know, I don't know. We'll play it by ear. We can talk about it at our next pre-meeting, Michael, when we see what happens. And where we are with this. But um, it doesn't seem like people come to um, our Zoom meetings or our public meetings, except the applicants. We don't get a huge audience unless uh, we eventually get to Jeff's favorite topic. And then there'll be 100 people in the room. And we'll have to have that in public. <laughs> yes, what? What? <laughs> okay. Offline. <laughs> Offline. So, uh, it's 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 meeting minutes. That's Jeff's favorite topic. Yeah. Is 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 I, meeting yeah. minutes. I thought we were done. I thought and we were caught up except for the last. I, I have to congratulate him on on uh, training Miranda and getting us all caught up on. Just, so un unfortunately, Darren cannot vote. Is is anybody comfortable voting on any sets of minutes tonight? I thought we did all of that. We did not do that, Chair. We did not do it in August, and and here 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 we are again since August. I thought is, is it? I made oh you don't have the August minutes. We made a motion to approve all five sets of minutes. I should, I'm sure we did. I believe at the July meeting we approved minutes from uh, January, and we did not approve any in August because of the volume of drafts that went out. There was at least five or six um, right. meeting and minutes. Yes, didn't yeah. we? I don't yeah, I sent, I sent my comments in on all five of them. 
I yes. thought we did, but I guess. Uh, but we not. we did not in August. No. I I reviewed all five, and I'm willing to vote on it tonight. Yeah. Me too. Do you have the dates? Three five four five. 517, 67, 621, and 75. You got it. So I, I, I heard a motion from John Clark. Okay. And I heard I'll a second, second from Mike Gee. Are we are we approving them as as, as amended? I suggested as amended, amended yes. by yes, by, as, okay. yeah, as amended Good. by Jeff. I have to so abstain. Everybody on... raise their hand except Darren. Wait a minute. I have wait, to wait, wait a minute. What? I have to abstain on 315 because I wasn't there. But I will vote on the rest of the four. I'll vote on all of them. <laughs> all five of them. I won't, well, amended. I'm good. Okay, we vote for all five. And, and I vote for the last four. And Joan votes for the last four. Okay, they're approved. Very a, good. Yeah, by a majority of the board. Thank Three you, of, Ryan. Boring. You're welcome. Thank you. No, thank you all. Yes, I, I thought we'd done that. Okay. Thanks for reminding us, Ryan. All right. So we'll see you on the 27th in three weeks. Yes. Can I throw, can I throw one more thing in before we leave? Sure. Yep. Go ahead, John. That house, the second house on South Street uh, behind the Seven Gables, that White House, um, we talked before that they had taken out the historic windows and put in big flat plane windows yes and the owners came before you guys i believe it was in june or july to change those uh and they got approval they have not returned um or they've not come back uh with with the building permit application they put mullions on the big windows yes they did somebody glued mullions to the giant windows but they haven't changed the windows yeah, and they didn't do the upper floors. I, I don't remember them coming in in June when I was at those meetings. Um, I'd have to check the agenda, but I do remember them uh, coming they before here you one guys. They, they, they were definitely before you guys. All right, because, check it out and we'll talk about it next time. Uh, yeah. Because they had brought in examples from Hobson Window right. of what they wanted to use and what they wanted to change. So it's going to be a temporary in the front there. They, it's a six foot tall window, and they just put a big X, you know, two two millions on it. I ran by it the other day and said, "That's not a new window. That's just something." Well, fortunately, I can look back in the minutes that you just you, you guys <laughs> just approved, and I can see when uh, they were here, and we can find out exactly what was discussed. Um, and we can definitely find out if they, uh, sidestepped or took a easier solution and we can find out. Okay. Just check it out for me. I don't, I don't remember them coming in and I was at those meetings, so maybe I'm having a, a senior uh, mom. Um, that would be. Uh, 15 South Street? No. Uh, 11 South Street? No, it's on the even side. Yeah, it's on the even side. Even. Um, hmm. I'll have to, I'll have to check that. Okay. I think it's six, Ryan. Six? Thank you, Darren. Six. Okay. Anything else? We have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. We have second. a second. Jeff. Jeff seconds it. John made the motion. All those in favor, raise your hand. Very good. We're adjourned. Hey. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have right. a good evening. Good to see you, Darren. Yeah, thank you. Greetings, Darren. Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah.